like to now hand over to last but certainly not least speaker of the day, David Wallacher, Chief Digital Officer from Oxford University Hospitals. Hi, so uh, good morning everybody. My name is David Wallacher and I'm the Chief Digital and Partnerships Officer at Oxford University Hospitals, which means I've essentially got two jobs. So I'm the Chief Digital Officer, which is a little bit self-explanatory, and the Chief Partnerships Officer, which means I've got responsibility for the trust strategy and the partners we work with to deliver the strategy. And I want to run through three things today, really, to build upon the previous presentations. The first of those is the, the what, the second of that is the why, and the last of it is the how. And if I can start with the, with the what. So the NHS long-term plan, which came out was it last year, 18 months ago now, it seems a lifetime ago, doesn't it, BC, before COVID. So the long-term plan came out. It set up a number of objectives for us um, to work through over the next decade as a, as a health service. And the big takeout item from that in relation to our outpatients was, of course, reduction in follow-ups, and efficiency due to digital technology. From that, we released the trust strategy um, earlier this year. We actually were due to release it in March, but at the point we went to release it, COVID hit, so we slightly delayed. So we went to release it in March, COVID came along, so we decided to delay this a bit till August and give us an opportunity just to reconsider our ambition, given the impact the COVID's had on the way that we deliver our care. Because as you can see in the strategic themes, um, our core and central strategic theme for the Trust is digital by default, which means that we've got to do channel shifts and we've got to do major transformation in the way we do the care using digital technology. And fundamental to that is to empower the patients to interact with and contribute to their care settings. And now just to touch on the, on the why. So what we've got here are the three, well, the very first Oxford Hospital way back when, if anyone can read the Latin on there or the uh, Roman numerals, I think it was 18 something, 1830s. Then we've got the plans to the Radcliffe, then we've got the John Radcliffe. So that's around about 200 years worth of hospital evolution in Oxford. And the one thing that's remained consistent throughout that time is there's been an outpatient department. So, well, so we can develop new care packages, new ways of working, new effective treatment techniques. Outpatients have sort of been central throughout and been a bit ripe for transformation over recent years. And then along came our friend COVID, which means that actually we don't really have a choice now but to transform the way that we provide outpatient services. In a very simple terms, you can't get 200 people in a waiting room anymore, so you're limited to 100 people per waiting room. You've also got patients who don't want to come into hospital because they're fearful of coming in for care. And I think Tom touched on earlier, we've seen DNA rates increase during COVID, even though our activity is decreased. So we've got a trust piece to go through with patients then. So we're doing things like moving to video consultations. So in Oxford in March, we did two video consultations. By the end of September, we're doing about 10,000 a month. So we've been able to ramp up significantly the use of video technology, and that's great in certain scenarios and where the patients are suited to it. But there's still a requirement to have face-to-face, -face, and you certainly need that in diagnostic type outpatient appointments. And also, I think, with the messaging. Um, you wouldn't want to give bad news, I don't think, necessarily of a video consultation. Medicine is a very personalised profession. It's arguably probably the most personalised profession in the world. You don't want to lose that interaction between the clinician and the patient. And this is from the NHS England report from 2018, which underpinned a lot of the requirements from the long-term plan. You know, 20% of the people didn't need to come in for their appointment. So that's, they didn't require to come in physically. 20% didn't need a follow-up appointment. So you can translate, you've got to be careful we don't get into the averages of averages on percentages here. But you can translate that to 40% of activity in outpatient departments didn't need to happen in the way that was previously happening. As a minimum, the target was about 63, 65%. So you can see a 30% reduction in follow-up appointments and a 5 to 10% shift in video consultations and really transform the way that we run outpatients. Now with COVID, I think we should be flipping that around. The 30% for follow-up appointments, I think if we move to a more patient-led follow-up value-based appointment system that um, has been touched upon, I think we get some efficiency gains. I don't think we should be aiming for 10% video. I think if we apply the digital by default, we should be looking for 60 to 70% in different settings. And then we can work differently and interact with patients differently and collect information that's pertinent to their care. 
And certainly with chronic conditions, this is where post-med follow-up comes into its own. If you've got Crohn's disease, you're probably going to have a 12-month follow-up routine appointment after uh, treatment. If you're not on any steroids and if you haven't got a flare-up, that appointment is not much more than a well-being check. So you won't want to necessarily lose that. You won't want to lose that interaction. But it's not beneficial to the patient. It's not beneficial to the caregiver. And we throw on top of that, previously, so you think before COVID, patients had to drive to hospital, they had to park. Um, I'm not sure what it's like in everybody else's hospitals up and down the country, but parking is never pleasant in the NHS. So you've got to get there, park, pay, run to an appointment that's late to so not really gain anything from it. Whereas if you're doing it by patient-led, those Crohn's patients could be contacted and raising for their appointment when their condition's deteriorating, when their flare-ups are happening, or when they've got um, concerns about their care. Much better way of delivering. And then just to touch on the why. So this is the newspaper headline from the Oxford Mail uh, when I was appointed um, in August last year. I started in October, uh, appointed in August, and they announced it in the Oxford Mail, and I saw there was one comment, and I thought, well, I'll be my mum. My mum going to say something nice about the starting in Oxford. Um, and it was, it was uh, one comment, which was, um, and I'll read it verbatim, does this mean we're only going to get one letter telling us our appointments instead of the three at the moment? The administration at Oxford is so bad it must cost a fortune. And I thought, well, they didn't bring that up in the interview. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'm going to start, I'm going to see, see what it's like. And um, the letter production was quite dreadful. And this is where we started working with Dr. Doctor on our letters. And touching on what Tom said before, you've got to build the platform first. So we're looking specifically at letter production and DNA, the costs of those. And any digital leader here on this call today that tries in any business case, I would suggest that you push your board to 50p in the pound. So for every pound that you can save the trust in either direct cost savings or efficiency gains, get 50p invested in digital to invest in the next round of digital technology to then make it a bit sell seedy as you go through your journey. Just to bring this into a bit of um, perspective, these are our, this is our letter cost, um, which you can see if we dis digitise 60% of the top four cost production areas, so that's it, if you know, I'll squint a little bit, nephrology, dermatology, oncology, and hematology, if we could achieve 60% digitisation of letters there, that's £450,000 direct cash save in a year. If we could achieve 60% across all our specialties, that's £1.8 million real cash savings per year. If you applied to 50p in the pounds, there's £1 million because you're investing in the next round of technology. The director of finance gets a £1 million pounds in your cost improvement programme. The patients are happier. There isn't a downside to this at all. And then if we talk about DNAs, here, um, DNAs are indirect costs. Because obviously what you want is you want an effective capacity and demand model for your outpatients department. But it does cost you indirectly rescheduling those appointments. Now, if you look at our top percentiles there, our top four, um, ophthalmology, trauma, hematology, and physiotherapy, cost us over a million pounds a year just in DNX. And we didn't think we were that bad at DNA rates. So you can see there, if you can get the activity and the demand through and you're planning better, then you'll get better efficiencies in your clinic. That then will drive better savings, and that, again, can be invested in technology. And then just to end on the, on the how, really, for, for Oxford. So for us, it's about empowering the patient. doesn't mean just giving them some information. They need to be able to interact with the information. They need to be able to interact with the trust. Now, we're doing it with three strategic partnerships, in effect. So we've got the doctor-doctor -doctor relationship, where we're looking to start with digitising the letters and the um, outpatient reminders. And then we're going to build on that, potentially, for the uh, patient-led followers and some of the problem information that we can plan We've also got our CERNA relationship, which means that we've pushed the patient portal now and we've populated the portal across all specialties rather than initially with really just for um, renal and cardiology. So we're, we're going big on the portal. And we've also, as you may have seen, announced last week, done a partnership with Apple so that now Apple are able to connect via a fire connection to our CERNA portal and put that information within the Apple health record which means that the patients have their full medical record with push notification on IOS. And then with the doctor-doctor piece, when we start developing the problems and patient-led follow-ups, this means that they should be able to then drive their appointment requirements based upon how they're feeling and the information we're collecting. So, for example, if we're doing regular um, bloods for, for renals, that we pushed to their phone. That gives us a strong platform. We now need to build on that platform, and we really need to transform as we move forward. And that's the end of my presentation.